Cloth Lullaby, The Woven Life of Louise Bourgeois. Words by Amy Noveski. Pictures by Isabel Arsenault. Louise was raised by a river. Her family lived in a big house on the water that wove like a wool thread through everything. The river's soil nurtured a garden where Louise and her family grew geraniums, peonies, asparagus, and cherry trees, apples and pears, purple tamarisk, pink hawthorn, and sweet-smelling honeysuckle. Along its banks, her father planted poplars. Louise kept diaries of her days, and in a cloth tent pitched in the garden, she and her siblings would stay till the dark surprised them. The light from the house and the sound of a Verdi opera far away through the trees. Sometimes they'd spend the night and Louise would study the web of stars, imagine her place in the universe, and weep, then fall asleep to the rhythmic rock and murmur of river water. The river provided flowers and fruit, a lullaby, and a livelihood. Louise's family restored tapestries, art woven from wool, and the wool loved the tannin-rich waters, which cleansed and strengthened it and allowed it to soak up color. At the family's workshop, Louise's mother, like her mother before her, repaired fabric grown threadbare with time. She loved to work in the warm sun, her needle rising and falling beside the lilting river, perfect, delicate spider webs glinting with caught drops of water above her. And when Louise was 12 years old, she learned the trade too, drawing in the missing fragments of a tapestry. It was often the bottoms of these fabric pictures that got the most wear and were most in need of repair. And so Louise became adept at drawing feet. Drawing was like a thread in a spider's web. Among tapestries neatly stacked like books in a library, Louise's mother taught her daughter about form and color and the various styles of textiles. Some bore elaborate patterns, others told stories. She taught her about the warp and the weft and how to weave, the tools of the trade, spiral shaped spindles, spools of wool and a needle. She taught her how to dye Purplish red was made from crushed cochineal bugs, indigo and goad, or yellow, from plants. Black wool came straight from the backs of black sheep, and that wool smelled. That's how you knew it was real. Louise's mother was her best friend, deliberate, patient, soothing, subtle, indispensable, and as useful as an arachne spider. Louise's father was not a restorer, but he appreciated fine things. He bought Louise beautiful clothes from Parisian department stores, but he was always leaving, which made Louise so mad she threw herself into the river. He brought back cloth scraps from his travels, and Louise's mother fixed them. Two halves of a cloth would find their way back together again. Rentrayage to reweave across the cut to make whole. Louise followed the river to Paris, where it flowed into the Seine. Little did she know that one day soon her beloved river would be gone, filled in, flowing no longer with the waters the wool loved, but with cars on their way to the city, a memory. At the university, she studied mathematics. She liked subjects with stability and order, like geometry and cosmography. Stars were predictable, so too the sunrise, the setting of the moon, but she was deeply disappointed to learn that math, like life, is uncertain. While she was still a student, her mother died. Louise was heartbroken. She felt abandoned and all alone, a thread broken. She abandoned math and the stars and turned to painting, applying the lessons she learned so far to art. The color blue pinches my heart.
She drew, she painted, she wove. She missed her mother so much she sculpted giant spiders made of bronze, steel, and marble. She named Maman. Her mother was not unlike a spider, a repairer of broken things. If you bash into the web of a spider, she doesn't get mad. She weaves and repairs it. Louise gathered all the fabric of her life, all the dresses and the garments her father had bought her, all the bed linens, towels, tablecloths, her new husband's handkerchiefs, and she cut it all up. And then she spent the rest of her life putting it back together again. She sewed, she stitched, she reworked, she wove, she stuffed stockings to create cloth sculptures and figures, a mother and daughter. She sewed colorful spirals and circular webs, and she sewed smaller, sweeter spiders, one woven of soft-colored ribbons, another of cloth, delicate metal. She made cloth drawings and cloth books, the blank pages, napkins from her wedding trousseau. She made books about the hours of the day and the dawn, the rising sun, and the stars she once loved. And because she did not want to forget a thing, she made a book about forgetting. Weaving was her way to make things whole. With the remaining fabric of her life, Louise wove together a cloth lullaby. She wove the river that raised her, maternal pinks, blues and watery hues. She wove a mother sewing in the sun, a girl falling asleep beneath the stars, and everything she ever loved. When she was done, all of her spiders beside her, she held the river and let it rock her again. All right, so we just finished listening to this book, Cloth Lullaby, which is about the life of Louise Bourgeois. And you probably noticed in the book a lot of the illustrations, many of the illustrations are in this beautiful red color. So let's look a little bit <clears throat> at Louise. So this is what Louise, these are two pictures of Louise, one when she's younger and one when she's older. And Louise is one of those artists that actually was better known for this picture. People knew her. If you see this picture, more people are going to recognize that than when she was younger because she. Um, this is when she had more... Uh, attention and, and notoriety. Um, so those are that's what she looked like. And then let's look at some of her work. So we talked about spirals before when we did the unit on Klempt. And remember a spiral just it starts in the middle and it's just bigger and bigger and bigger in circles without the lines touching. Or you can start on the outside and do smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller circles without the lines touching. But take a good look at this because uh, sometimes if people just look at this quickly, it looks like a doodle. But if you look at it a little more closely, and you look at how the lines are connected, how she's put these spirals within the square, that's really fun. Okay, and then this is the one that we're going to practice, kind of do our version of today. Um, and the thing I like about this is when I show this to people and we talk about um, abstract art or art that doesn't look like anything in particular, a lot of times people want to, it want, they want to look, recognize something. They want to look at it and say, well, I think that looks like this, or I think this looks like that. And that's fine. A lot of kids tell me they think this looks like um, typewriter keys on an old-fashioned typewriter. <laughs> All right, so supplies today for this are super simple. All you're going to need is some copy paper and something red to make a mark with. It could be a red marker, it could be a red crayon, it could be a red pencil. I'm going to use a marker so that it shows up nice and bright for you to see. Um, but anything that makes a red mark would would work fine. So we were you know, we're going to kind of do our version of this. Um, and again, we I never am going to ask you to try to copy it. I'm never going to try to say make yours look just like hers. But what we have that's going to be the same is we start off with the piece of paper that's going to be blank. And this is kind of fun because it almost, I think it's music paper. Um, I think if you look really carefully, this is paper that you would compose music on. Um, and she's got primarily two shapes happening here. She has some really long overlapping, um, I don't know if you even call those ovals because they're so long. It's almost like a rounded rectangle. And then the rest of them are pretty, are pretty much circles. 
Um, but let's just look carefully, because this, these are some of our options we're going to think about when we do our version of this, our, our version of Louise Bourgeois. Some of the circles overlap. These kind of look like Venn diagrams. <laughs> and some of them, the ones at the very first row, don't even touch. They don't even touch each other. Oh, actually they do. They overlap a little bit too. But you can see the difference, and there's also, what else is different? The difference in the sizes. There's small, there's big. Um, one fun question I like to ask people when they first look at this is, if you had to guess, how do you think she did this? Do you think she started at the top and did those two big, long, overlapping shapes and then the little tiny circles and had it get bigger and bigger and bigger? Or do you think she started at the bottom with these big shapes and got smaller, 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 and then finished up with those. Well, you know what's really funny? I don't know. <laughs> we have no idea. I just like to ask that question because people have a really definite idea of how they would do it. Um, and that's great. That's what's fun about being an artist is that you get to decide how, where you're going to make the mark, what yours is going to look like. Even if we're all using a red pen and a white piece of paper, I promise you when we do this in classrooms, Every single one of them ends up looking different because you get to make those decisions. So I personally, I want to start off similar to her because just because I think that's a fun way to begin. And I'm going to start with, I think I'm going to do three though. Three kind of long overlapping ovally shapes. Now the only uh, kind of rules or guides that I would say, don't run off your paper because it looks nice to keep everything within the edges. So don't run off and write on the sides. Um, other than that, and also, sorry, one more thing, go all the way down. Finish, finish doing your drawing. Some people might think this is a good warm-up exercise. If you were going to make art, some artists like to do things to kind of warm up their fingers, warm up making marks. So this, these are kind of fun warming up exercises to do this. All right, so now I'm going to make just some medium. And just because I like how it looks, I'm having mine overlap just a tiny bit, not much. And remember when we're doing art, it does not have to be perfect. This one is a little bit smaller than that. That doesn't bother me. Okay, now I feel like doing some little tiny ones. And I like these just touching. The sides are touching, but they're not overlapping. And you can see this takes a long time. But I think it's really relaxing. I think drawing like this, especially when there's no pressure, it doesn't have to look like anything. When you get done with it, if you don't like it, you don't have to keep it. Um, I'll tell you something fun you can do with this when we get finished if you want. All right, I like that row. Now I'm going to make a bigger row of circles. Again, these are not overlapping. They're just touching each other. And they're roughly pretty much the same size. They don't have to be though. I could make a really big one in the middle if I wanted. But I like how this looks kind of even. I like the idea that, I like how hers looked like rows. I like that too. So I'm gonna keep mine in rows. Okay, what next? You know, for some reason, I kinda wanna make some big ones again. And I like these a little bit they're not completely circles. They're like, if you took a circle and kind of squished it or stretched it a little bit, I like these, these are a little bit less round. <laughs> they're still a circular shape, but they're kind of stretched out a little bit. All right, and since a lot of you are doing this from home, I just thought of a question. Oh, look, how, that one's way bigger. I could make a really big one there if I wanted. So here's a, here's a thought that might happen. I'm using this marker Sometimes you know what happens with markers, even if it's brand new, sometimes it starts to run out of ink. And I kind of feel like this one, even though this is brand new, it's the first time I've used it, it feels a couple times when I was drawing, it felt like it wasn't that dark. So let's pretend if I was doing this exercise at home and my marker started to dry up and I can't run out and get another marker, pick up something else that's red and finish that. Do something with that. Oh, that's kind of cool. So this is what crayon mark looks like. It's not as smooth as the marker. It's not as bright. It's got texture because when I'm, I'm drawing on this uh, table and crayon is super sensitive, it picks up whatever's underneath it. And just even this brown craft paper that I'm using as a tablecloth, you can see when you look at, I'm gonna hold this up so you can see it better. When you look at the lines, 
See how that te there's texture in my marks? Can you all see that? Marker is just completely smooth. Crayon, it's like kind of rough. It's got a little rough line. Um, all right, I'm going to do an some really big ones now. Well, they're not really big, but they're bigger than the other ones. So, and if you remember, or here I'll show you a quick look. When Louise did hers, her rows touch each other, and you might like how that looks. I kind of like having a little space in between. So mine are not touching. My row underneath is not touching the row above it. But it sure could. It's your drawing. You can do whatever you want. Okay, now I think I need something kind of smaller, but not a circle. So I'm doing kind of those long, rounded at the end shapes. I think you're going to find, for some of you, that when you start doing this, it actually feels really relaxing for some reason. So something about doing a repeated image. I'm not counting. I'm not doing a particular pattern. I'm just kind of doing what, what looks good to my eye. And now I'm ready to try to switch back to the marker again because I do like how that dark looks. Okay, so I started doing that. I'm not crazy about how that looks, so I could go back and t touch these so it looks more like circles instead of ease. <laughs> this one, I don't know if I like as much how it looks, but it feels very satisfying. Because I'm not lifting. I'm keeping my pen on the paper. All right. So you get the general idea here. I'm not going to go ahead and do my whole, I'm not going to finish it today. I know you're probably excited to try this. Um, let's say that you get started on this and you're not really happy with how it's looking. Go ahead and finish all the way down. Sometimes when you're doing art and you get part way through or you get halfway through or you might get almost all the way to the end, sometimes you don't like how it looks. But just keep going. That's a, a good, really uh, good way to work through things. It's a good practice to make yourself finish it. And if you get done and you don't like it, that's fine because you were just practicing anyway. Um, and also, another thing you can do you get this one all done. If you liked it so much, you can flip it over and do it on the back. And even though there's a little bit of the marker image that shows through, once you start doing yours, however you do it, you're not really going to see that. That one's fun. I like that shape. Anyway, you get the general idea there. And again, this is a piece of art. Even if we're doing it as a warm-up exercise, it's certainly fine when you get done to sign your name down on the bottom. Uh, good luck with these, and we would love to see what you do. So send us back on Facebook um, images of the work that you've done. We'd love to see it. Good luck.